Welcome to Bible study. Um, this is session eight of Explore the Bible. And my name is Sam Fuller, and I'll be your um, leader today as we study this. Um, it's my privilege to do this. I hope God will show us something special and new today. Uh, the title of our lesson is Remembered. <clears throat> it's in Luke chapter, chapter 22, and it's verses 7 through 20. The main thought is that we should remember Jesus' costly sacrifice uh, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Um, the command to remember is a central theme throughout the Bible. And usually God followed that command with a reminder of the work that He had done in their lives. Remember uh, who you are. It's like saying, remember where you've come from and where you've been. Remember what your story is, because if we forget our history, then we can't fully understand our present role in the Lord's Supper even. And so I don't know about you, but my memory is quickly fading. I have times when I can't find my glasses and they're on the top of my head or I'm going to a room and I uh, forget why I'm going in there. Uh, and you may laugh about that, but you'll be there before it, too long. It'll sneak up on you. Um, so today's scripture, we're called to remember Christ's sacrifice. And as Baptists, we have set, a time, set aside a time to, to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. This is actually one of two ordinances of our church, baptism being the other. And ordinance simply means, it means it's a ritual, a reminder, a demonstration of what we believe in as who we are as believers. So as we study this today, you can keep that in mind that the Lord's Supper, we're told to remember to do it. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And as we do that, we know that we have celebrated this many times in our Christian life, and we know that that means we follow his example. Uh, and the bread will represent his broken body and the, and the wine, his blood that's shed for us. It's a solemn time of worship, but it's also a time to draw near to God and to the others in our church. So let's explore the text. The first section of this is called Prepared. Um, and this verses 7 through 13. Verse 7 says, Then the day of unleavened bread came when the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. While the feast of the unleavened uh, bread was a seven-day feast, this was the actual day of the unleavened bread. And it's a day of preparation. It's a time when they gathered all that they would need for the Passover supper. Uh, it took place on the 14th day of the Jewish month of Nisan, uh, which corresponds to our calendar late March or uh, in April. And not only was the bread baked without any yeast or any leaven, uh, it was done that because, and the Jews actually took all of the leavening out of their house during that time. They didn't want it in their homes, and that was a, a reference in that in Exodus 12 and 15. And the original Passover, um, the primary reason for making the bread without leaven, because they were going to have to hurry and leave, and they didn't know exactly when they were going to leave. And, and so it was necessary for them to get out of Egypt. They couldn't wait for their bread to rise before they could leave, because when the Beth angel appeared, they had to be ready. And even leaven sometimes also symbolizes sin. Uh, Jesus warned the disciples against the leaven or the yeast that was in the Pharisees and not to be a part of that. Um, also on this day, a Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, a substitutionary sacrifice for their sin. Uh, the lamb was chosen four days earlier, and it was kept for this particular occasion. And in Exodus, the sacrificial lamb, we know, of course, was a covering for sin. And when the angel of the Lord passed over their homes, they only, they, uh, with the blood of the Door, uh, with the blood of the lamb on their doorpost. And so those without the blood then suffered the death of each family's firstborn. So it was important that that blood was on their doorposts. So the Hebrews were commanded to make this observation every year, an annual occasion, uh, to remind each generation how far they had come and that God was the one who had redeemed them. He was the one who led them. He reminded them time and time again, I am the Lord your God. I, I got you out of Egypt. I delivered you from Egypt. Um, and even though they didn't understand at that point what the Passover would come to mean, um, it would. we know for us that it comes, comes to 
mean the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world, slain for our salvation once and for all. Verse 8 says, Jesus sent Peter and John and told them, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. And they asked him, where do you want us to prepare this? It's interesting that Jesus chose Peter and John, just these two, because that choice is interesting. Uh, on occasion, several occasions, Peter, James, and John uh, were together. Jesus pulled them out. He took them to the Mount of Transfiguration with him. Uh, several other times they were together, but this time it was just Peter and just John. Um, he instructed them to make preparations for the Passover meal, and by doing this, Jesus uh, created the 12, all of the apostles, into a family for this family celebration. Because remember, they had left their families. They had forsaken all to follow Jesus. Um, and so this family uh, celebration would be uh, such a unique time because the Passover, God's Passover lamb was going to be a part of that. Well, preparations would include, uh, they didn't ask too many questions except where do you want to go? But the pass Passover preparations would include finding a place for the meal and taking a lamb, finding a lamb and taking that lamb to be, to be slaughtered. You know, Jesus' uh, appointments were not haphazard. They had a place and a, and a, a very, it was a pre-selected uh, appointment that he had for them because he assigns certain tasks because the experience of that is often as just as much uh, important as important as the accomplishment and God can do whatever he wants and he sovereignly chooses to employ people flesh and blood people to do things then in the visible realm that are done in the invisible even Jesus uh, the, says the word became flesh and dwelt among us, among us so he could show us what it's meant to be and what, it, what an abundant life can be. And so it's not only that Peter and John were chosen the job, but also the job was chosen for them. Way before time began, this job was chosen just for them. Many scholars believe that John was the youngest disciple, the youngest of all the apostles. And this passage today is one of those that justifies that belief because traditional Jewish Passover, the youngest child that could talk, was often uh, asked, gets to sit near the father or the father figure at the table and asks the questions of the Passover. The very first one is, why is this night different from all nights? And there were other questions as the night went along, and they explained the exodus from, from the Egypt. And those went along, but that, this scripture sort of um, makes sure, or is, is, uh, is a, I can't think of the word, is a, a justification that they thought that John was the youngest. And so he's, uh, someone has said, too, that John met Jesus and just never got over him. He always wanted to be close to Jesus. It's not a coincidence, too, that John and Peter's repetitive use of the word, the Lamb of God, of that phrase, is in their uh, writings, in John's gospel and Peter's writings. That phrase is used more than any other writers in the New Testament. A tremendous part of that understanding is what they're going to do in this lesson today, or what they did, as they looked at the preparation for the Passover with Christ. They were also probably deeply influenced by John the Baptizer, John the Baptist. We know that each of them was discipled either by John himself or by their brothers, Andrew or James. We know that Andrew brought Peter to meet Jesus. And we know that John the baptizer, what did he say when he first saw Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And so Jesus wouldn't rest until Peter and John knew exactly what that title was going to be. So when they were in their preparation, they couldn't just run to the old city Walmart and grab a plastic wrapped uh, uh, trimmed lamb. Uh, they had to pick out a live lamb and had the sweet little lamb slaughtered. It was very likely they held it still for the knife, blood on their hands during that. 
And since they were visitors to Jerusalem, though, they naturally wondered about where in the world uh, that Jesus would want them to prepare this. The Passover was usually celebrated in a home, sometimes involving extended family members or several family members, and nothing in the gospel narrative suggests that they knew or had any acquaintances in Jerusalem or knew anybody or anywhere they could go to have this uh, Passover meal. Uh, they probably wondered where in the world we would go. Jerusalem is filled with travelers from all over the world at this time. Uh, and there once again might not be a place, a room in the inn for Jesus. Verse 10 says, Listen, he said to them, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a water jug will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. Verse 11, Tell the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I can go and have the Passover meal with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished room upstairs. Make the preparations there. So they went and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Uh, when Jesus said, "You've entered," when you enter the city, this conversation likely took place on the Mount of Olives. During the week following his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Jesus taught during the temple, taught in the temple during the week, and during and at night he spent the night on the Mount of Olives east of the city. Well, first of all, this is a little bit unusual because Jesus identified a man carrying a jug. That's how you're gonna know where to go. That's pretty unusual because men didn't carry water jugs. That was usually left something that was left to the women. So that must have kind of posed a question in their mind. Um, the second thing is that this man would come to meet him. They could just look for a man carrying a water jug, but he was actually going to come and find them. I'm sure they, they were relieved by that. But Jesus knew already, he knew the location of the Passover and had arranged for this, evidently, for this man to meet the disciples near the eastern, eastern gate. And thirdly, they were to follow him until he enters the house. Jesus did not say follow the man to the house, but follow the house, follow him to the house and enter to the house. This man was not the owner, but in as they entered the house, then they would meet the homeowner. They were to identify themselves and their need by referring to the G Jesus as the teacher. This is not the word for rabbi, which was used to identify him many times, but this was just a teacher. And so Unlike Jesus' instructions when he asked the disciples to go and find him a donkey, he said in that, thing, in that for, uh, instance, the Lord tell him that the Lord has need of this. But they did not have that. In this, he just said, go and tell them you need it. So Jesus described a large furnished room that was upstairs. Exactly, very specific, and that's exactly what it, what it was. Some people think this could be the same uh, the same room that the disciples went to after the crucifixion. Might have been the same room they went to after the, the ascension or even the day of Pentecost when they received the Holy Spirit. All of that is really pretty speculative because no one knows for sure. But it was an upper room, it was very large, and it was just what Jesus had asked for. You know, they didn't ask any other questions of Jesus. They just did what Jesus did. The key phrase there is, they found it just as Jesus had told them exactly all the, the uh, directives that Jesus had carried out. And so this, was, this made it easy for them to get everything ready before the others had arrived. They prepared for him, but really he had already pre prepared for them a long time ago. So the next section is called Looking Forward. It's verses 14 through 18. Verse 14 says, When the hour had come, he reclined at table, and the apostles were with him. And then he said to him, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So all the pre preparations had been completed. Jesus reclined at the table, the phrase says. During meals, people generally did not sit in chairs, as depicted in so many of the beautiful paintings that we have um, and portrayals of the Lord's Supper or the Last Supper. Usually they reclined on low couches, and so they were almost leaning on one another. 
The term apostles is in reference to the twelve, as they're usually called. They were identified who were reclining with Jesus. Um, this meal was just them, just Jesus and the twelve apostles. And sometimes they leaned against each other, as I said, but I think John, the youngest, was near Jesus because he wanted to ask him some questions. He was seated next to him, but the phrase uh, that Jesus uses is that he was um, fervently, that he fervently desired to celebrate this with them. He knew what was coming. Jesus knew what was coming. Um, it was not that he was eager to go to the cross. We know that. We understood that. He knew he was going to suffer. He had told them that many times. I think he just wanted to spend special time with them, these closest to him, and he would introduce to, him, to them the true meaning of the Passover and show them that fulfillment. Verse 17 says, Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For now, for now I tell you, from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. There it phrase again, until the kingdom comes. The term then doesn't mean that he was giving the he gave them the cup immediately following his opening remarks, because we know from the other gospel of John that included uh, Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. And he was making also reference to that one who would who would uh, betray him. Um, and that's not in this gospel, but it is in John's. And so he, the, this was a cup that was meant to be shared. It was one of the series of four cups during the Passover meal. Each one represented a particular time of their deliverance from uh, Egypt. The apostles were to share this common cup among themselves. Probably they passed it around. Jesus handed the cup to the apostles after giving thanks, even though he knew what was going to happen. He gave thanks. Um, the next phrase, this gives us hope, as this gives us hope as believers, because we can look forward to joining in the kingdom to come. We can look forward to joining Jesus in a great celebration and a great banquet in his kingdom, and it'll be the marriage feast of the, of the Lamb of God and his bride, the church. And together with him forever, we will rejoice and praise and celebrate the one who saved us and made us his own. So the next section is called Looking Back. It's verses 19 and 20. This is the part we're most familiar with because this is the part most pastors use when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Verse 19, And he took bread and he gave thanks, and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. Um, Philippians 2.17, Paul uses that phrase, I am being poured out as a, live, as a drink offering. That poured out means everything, poured empty, poured until it's gone. And Jesus was poured out for us. He gave everything. Along with the lamb, the unleavened bread was also a part of the Passover meal, the family having recited the Exodus story throughout the meal and through all the questions, and they had sung the part, the parts of the traditional Hallel collection of Psalms. These are found in Psalms 113 through Psalms 118. And they he would give a prayer over the bread and eat the Passover meal. And Jesus apparently took the role of the father or the father of the family and gave thanks for the bread. And as he did, he replaced the Passover celebration with a new celebration of unleavened bread. This one interpreted the bread not as representing what Israel had to carry out of Egypt, but as the body of Jesus broken on the cross. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. It's, it's another uh, use of the word broken. He is broken body given for us. Um, it's difficult to know how they might have reacted as Jesus spoke of his body given for them. This was not something they had heard before. Um, he asked uh, later they would realize what he had done at the cross and, they, he, and why he wanted them to repeat this again and again. 
No longer would they need to celebrate the Passover and look back to the Exodus redemption. Now they could celebrate the Lord's Supper and look at what Jesus has done on the cross for them. As stated earlier, their Passover included four cups of wine, <clears throat> excuse me, drunk at specific, specific intervals, four cups, each meaning something at four different times. The last two came after the meal and were separated by the reading of the rest of the Psalms. Jesus took this occasion in one of these cups to transform the meaning of Passover, transforming the Jewish celebration into the Christian Easter. This cup would serve as an eternal reminder that Jesus had spilled his blood for them. Passover celebrated the old covenant that was given on Mount Sinai. But the Lord's Supper, this new one, celebrates the new covenant of Jeremiah 31, 31, which says, this covenant will be written on your hearts, on the hearts of the people rather than on tables of stone. The blood sacrifices sealed the old covenant. They had to continually sacrifice animals, doves, birds. Had to be good, had to be perfect for them to sacrifice that time and time and time again. But the new covenant, Christ's blood, would seal and ratify by His blood. No longer would they need to look back to, to Mount Sinai for their redemption. No longer would they need to celebrate a yearly day of atonement. Now they look to Jesus and his death on the cross as the sole sufficient means of their atonement. Now they would celebrate the Lord's death until he came. Can you imagine how John must have felt as he stood at the cross, at the foot of the cross with Jesus' mother Mary? as he stood and watched what was happening and the blood that flowed from Jesus, do you think that he remembered that little lamb that he slaughtered and the blood that was on his hands? Do you think that he was astonished that he made that connection and he remembered those words maybe that he had heard from Isaiah 53 that said he was wounded for our transgressions, he was pierced, for our iniquities, and the Lord laid on him all the iniquity of all of us. See, the, the bad thing about, the hard thing about the cross and Jesus suffering as he did physically, he suffered horribly. It was an awful death, and he suffered that. Nothing compares to the sin that he took on. He took on my sin and your sin. God turned his back on him and didn't see that sin because he took my sin on him. And he took that because he loves us, because we have a loving God. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, every time we celebrate, we remember what he did. Long ago, J.C. Ryle wrote, he that eats the bread and drinks the wine in the right spirit will find himself drawn into a closer communion with Christ and in, will feel to know him more and understand him better. This is still true today, that as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, his sacrifice, his taking on sin for us, he was the atoning, the only one able to take on our sin, and he did it because he loves us. He loves us so much. He gave His Son, poured out for us. So we can remember that as next time as we take the Lord's Supper. So I hope this, this lesson has been uh, an eye-opening experience for you, a remembrance to, as Jesus said, remember when you do this, do it in remembrance of me and the sacrifice that I've made. Father, thank you so much for your Son for giving your son for us to take on our sins so that we might have an abundant life, a life that is a joy to live when we live in you. Help us to remember each time we take this, help us to remember the sacrifice that you've made and the resurrection that we can, suffer, we can share because you are God and you are holy. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today.